Hello, I'm Wes Sargentson, welcoming you to the February edition of the United Report. This edition of the United Report covers a wide range of interesting and informative subjects. You'll see the man behind America's favorite cartoons, the nonstop action of indoor soccer. You'll see why Catholic priests are becoming an endangered species. And the man who walked around the world backwards. And now for the cover story on the United Report. These two famous cartoon characters have something in common. So do these two, and hundreds of others. The same man does their voices. Mel Blanc has been the king of cartoons for more than 40 years. In 1937, I went into cartoons. And the first voice was a drunken bull. Drunken right? bull, yeah. Can you remember that one? Well, sure. I can remember him. It was look of, look of the sour mash. When Mel Blanc talks, everyone listens. He's the vocal wizard who gave the gift of speech to some of the most famous cartoon characters of all time. He's created so many voices that in most cartoons, he's literally talking to himself. Hey, uh, what's your territory? Thermopolis, Wyoming. His favorite over the years has been Bugs Bunny, and he still remembers the day he first saw the feisty rabbit. They showed me a picture of Bugs Bunny. And they said he was a tough little stinker. So I thought, which is the toughest voice, either Brooklyn or the Bronx? So I uh, put the two of them together. That's how I got the voice for Bugs, Doc. Mm -hmm. When Bugs made his screen and debut and in 1939, Mel already had a hot radio career, guest starring with some of the most famous performers of the time. Many of those performers later became the inspiration for his unique vocal characterizations. The storyboard said that he was the greatest lover on the screen. So I thought maybe a voice similar to Charles Boyer, who was a great lover, you know. So I thought, the, the pussycat, <laughs> I see the pussycat, she has the white stripes down her back, so I chase her and catch her and kiss her. You know, somebody saying is probably the toughest one that I do. He's kind of raucous on the throat. My name's Yosemite Sam. Do that long enough and you won't be able to talk. <laughs> the idea of leaving Yosemite Sam or any other cartoon character without a voice prompted Mel years ago to start teaching someone else to do them. And the person he chose was his son, Noel. After all, he'd already had years of training. I was two or three years old, two years old, I can remember real easily. Every morning after breakfast, he would read the comics to me. It wasn't long before Noel was reading them back, and his father realized he'd found a natural understudy. I said, hey, this is, 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 is certainly is a, 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 a long road, is, is, isn't it? You know, you know, He'd say, yes, it sure is, it sure is, it is the longest. Noel's education began in earnest in 1961, after Mel was involved in a near-fatal auto accident. The two formed a company to produce television commercials, which Noel directed, a job he still prefers to imitating his father's voices. I don't want to do it unless I, it's very necessary to do it when he says, hey, I know I can, I'm too tired today to do this voice. Would you do Brugs? And I would, you know. That's right, Doc. I would do it. It's a, a great feeling to know that uh, he will continue when I'm gone. And, uh, it must be in our genes or something, because he, he sounds exactly like me. You're real. Of course I'm real, Daffy. The Mel Blanc voices you hear in cartoons today are still Mel Blanc's, though. Today, it's estimated that over 200 million people hear his voice daily. And at age 74, that voice and the man behind it are still going strong. Say, I'm working harder now than I ever did, and uh, uh, they can't stop me. My wife says to me, why don't you retire, you know, and... Uh, I say, you know, I'm going to keep going until I keel over. For Mel Blanc, retiring while he still had a voice would be a form of surrender. And like the feisty rabbit he created, he's not about to do that. Surrender? Never heard of the way. So I'm Joel Parks in Hollywood. These abandoned windmills are the relics of a lost era, when Americans could meet their own demands for electrical power. Today, massive dams and coal-fired plants can barely keep up with the nation's needs. And the promise of a nuclear solution has met with increasing public resistance. Some energy experts now believe that the answer may once again be blowing in the wind. The high plains of Wyoming, mile after desolate mile of windswept prairie, 
The U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, working with NASA, has erected two gigantic wind turbines here on the dry plains near Medicine Bow, Wyoming. They are not simple, small towers like their water-pumping ancestors. They are huge, computer-controlled wind turbines, one standing 391 feet from the base of its steel tower to the tip of its mammoth fiberglass blades. It is the world's largest windmill. The sound of a piece of steel the size of a football field cutting through the air, blade tips traveling nearly 200 miles per hour, is impressive. But so too is the amount of power these machines can generate. Combined, they will produce enough electricity for 3,000 homes. There are plans to build 25 to 40 more of these giant wind generators, creating the nation's first wind farm. It would produce enough electricity to supply more than 40,000 homes. Today, however, the cost of the machines and the power they produce is high. But by the end of the decade, that could change. On handmade machines, it's not competitive. But if they went in for production, they will be competitive with uh, uh, coal-fired plants in 1990. While the problems of cost may be overcome, wind power has an even more serious drawback. What happens when the wind doesn't blow? The Flaming Gorge hydroelectric plant, some 250 miles away, could provide the answer. Connected to the same transmission lines as the dam, the wind farm would reduce demand on the plant's water supply. The water saved would become a kind of energy battery, storing power, to be released when the wind subsides. It will take $200 million to build the wind farm. Once the money is available, the wind farm could be in full production within five years. Jerry Anders reporting. Next up on the United Report, a crisis in the Catholic priesthood, and soccer comes in from the cold. Today, more than ever, world development is dependent on international trade. Yet the international marketplace has become more complex, requiring more sophisticated banking services. To meet these needs, one bank, Bank of America, is providing international business with more on-site experts in more countries than most other banks. With a banking network of over 75 nations, Bank of America can handle details at both ends of many trade transactions. Every working day, the bank processes thousands of commercial letters of credit to help move goods quickly and smoothly from exporter to importer. Bank of America also packages its trade services with other financial services, like international collections, foreign exchange, and global money transfers. Trade finance services, another way Bank of America leads the way, meeting the needs of international trade around the world. Look to the leader, Bank of America. This may look like a Las Vegas stage show, but it's really the opening moments of a Major League indoor soccer game. Bringing soccer indoors has created a whole new sport, and it's capturing the attention of a growing number of American fans. Great, it's a lot of fun, I really enjoyed it. It's a fast game. Oh, the people, everybody's so excited. The game itself, the players are always moving. A lot of action out there. What has been called the universal sport, outdoor soccer, has had problems adapting in America. The American sports fan wants high-scoring, fast-paced action. No, no breaks, no calls or plays. It's just constant action, always gone. Great game. It's a fast sport, and people are catching on to it now. It's going to be good. Indoor soccer, with 15-minute quarters, averages 11 goals a game and a shot on goal each minute. A goal is scored by an individual effort or as a result of team play. The bright red ball is used for ease in following game action on the green artificial turf. Formed six years ago, the major indoor soccer league is outdrawing its professional counterparts in basketball and hockey in St. Louis, Cleveland, and Kansas City, averaging almost 15,000 fans per game. The league drew over three million fans last season. All-star Dave McWilliams and coach Kenny Cooper credit part of the success of indoor soccer to its fans. 
they really uh, put a charge into us and get our adrenaline pumping, and it's really great to play in front of big crowds. It's more of a happening. It's a, it's a wonderful game and just, uh, I think, a special event. And uh, I know I can't wait as a coach. I get charged up for the magic of the moment, which is 7.30 when the game starts. And you see people leave with a, with a smile on the face, and that's all you want. Like hockey and basketball, indoor soccer is played from November through May. The 12 MISL teams play a 48-game season. This is not the international game, and soccer purists may turn their noses up at it. But indoor soccer is a new sport with extravagant staging, fast-paced action, and high scoring. American fans are discovering indoor soccer to be a whole new game. This is Al Troutwig reporting. For the past 20 years, the world's population of Catholics has continued to grow. But the number of Catholic priests and seminary students has steadily declined, leaving many churches seriously understaffed. The last 20 years has seen more than 12,000 Catholic priests turn their backs on their vocations, leaving the priesthood never to return. While each priest left for individual reasons, one of the most common is celibacy, the ban on priests getting married and being able to have a wife and children. For the priest, his family must be his parish. His children are the baptized babies, the altar boys, the kids who come to Sunday Mass. In that sense, he has more children than any of his parishioners. Still, he has none of his own. I don't think it ever stops being an issue, even for a priest. You know, a priest has to daily live the celibate life. But I think it's a genuine question of, of human relationships and whether or not they can find that in the celibate life. Father Raymond Ensman is the vicar of priests, sort of the chief personnel officer in the Toledo, Ohio diocese. In the last five years alone, he has seen 12 priests hang up their collars. For several, celibacy was the reason. What kind of fit them at one time sometimes doesn't fit as they mature and go through life. Others, even if encouraged, hesitate entering the seminary or priesthood because there are few monetary rewards. The priest is uh, working uh, all day long and uh, doesn't get paid for, uh, you know, 16 or 18 hours of work. And um, they say, you know, well, I'm not going to do that. I don't get paid for it. This is the cop of my blood. The priest shortage is now to the point that a growing number of parishes have only one priest for every two to 3,000 churchgoers. And while there's no easy solution, many Catholics feel they know some answers. Probably more help with the real poor that would want to be priests that can't afford it. I think that's one of the big problems. I think if they change the celibacy rule, and maybe if they let more women become, if they let women become priests, maybe we wouldn't have such a shortage. Pope John Paul II and other church leaders have said they are against two major changes to solve the priest shortage, allowing priests to be married and allowing women into the priesthood. So without those changes or an increase in young men wanting to be priests, the answer is for parishioners to do more priestly work. That's um, a mixed blessing of the priest shortage that we're seeing lay people assume a better role within the church community. Now this man, called a permanent deacon, can preach, perform marriages, do things once restricted only to priests. But they are lay people. They can be married and work outside the church. Some parishes now have as many permanent deacons as they have priests. And lay involvement will be needed more and more as Catholics continue to ask who will wear the collar. I'm John Cullerton reporting. Mention the word farm and most Americans think of the rich Midwestern plains and fields of soybeans, wheat and corn. But Sam Demangi is a different kind of farmer. His fields are very narrow and all of them are underwater. But then that's the kind of farm Sam wanted. You see, Sam is chief cook and bottle washer at the Bucksnort Trout Ranch. I went to the library to find out what kind of farm uh, was going to be most appropriate. In other words, you could raise wheat and get $350 an acre, or you could raise catfish and get $1,000 an acre. And so I really started looking for catfish farms. Eventually, I wound up uh, looking at uh, trout farms, and I haven't made any money since. <laughs> <laughs> There are no expensive tractors or combines to harvest this crop. All you need is a pair of waders and a net. But then wheat was never this noisy. 
Now, in trout farming, just like every other kind of farming, there are lots of things to remember. What kind of feed works the best, the temperature of the water, how much oxygen is in the water. But once you get the fish to this point, then it's ready for market. Now, the ones that we butcher and take to the market, um, we, we grade those physically by hand. Each fish is measured for a length, which represents a, a specific weight for us. Uh, after they have been, been graded by hand, then we take them in and, and uh, we butcher them to order. If you have to work with a half million fish just about every day, how often do you have fish for supper? As little as I can. <laughs> this is Bob Williams reporting. Still to come on the United Report, the world's champion backward walker. Marathon. It commemorates the legendary achievement of a Greek soldier, a soldier who in 490 BC ran from Marathon to Athens to bring news of the victory over the Persians. It was a demanding distance of over 25 miles. It remains today as one of the greatest tests of human endurance and stamina. To run and run and run, to stand up to stress, to be alert, adapt to changing conditions. Five years ago, one company, Xerox, set out to create a new generation of copiers that would deliver the same feat of endurance and more, so reliable that they could also be called marathons. Today, the Xerox 10 series of marathon copiers live up to their name. Each of these copiers has passed an unprecedented array of stress tests. And with the help of advanced electronics and a wide choice of features, they're as adaptable as they are rugged. The 1075 marathon copier is so intelligent, it continuously monitors itself to perform at its peak level. In fact, before it's even off and running, it races through over 100 critical warm-ups. Other marathons, like the Xerox 1035 and 1045, not only adapt to changing conditions, but anticipate the unexpected. They can even help those who operate them. And another, the Xerox 1020, is so efficient and compact, it's hard to believe it can stand up to the stress of running hour after hour after hour. The Xerox Marathon Copiers. What's in a name? A legendary feat of endurance and more. Eighty-eight-year-old Pliny Wingo puts his pants on the same as anyone else before he warms up for his daily walk. But when he steps out with his rear-view mirror glasses, he can't be mistaken for anybody else. Like the driveway says, Pliny is world champion. His name is in the Guinness Book as the man who walked backwards 8,000 miles in the early 1930s, an era when the world was just crazy enough to let him do it. At that time, there were marathon dancers. Then every flagpole had a sitter on it. But the sillier they could make it, the better they liked it. And I thought this would be crazy enough to show the world something but different. I guess so. I never thought of it that way. Yeah. Well, what's the technique? You just sort of... Well, you put your toe down like that behind you. Okay. That's why I always wear the toes out in front of putting it down first. <laughs> Do you get a lot of attention when you walk backwards? Oh, yes. I always did get attention. But never more attention than from his Texas to Boston backward walk in 1931. And after catching a ship to Germany, the continuation of that walk from Hamburg to Istanbul, Turkey, a couple of years later. Naturally, he got written up in every newspaper from Kansas City to Constantinople. Finally wound up with uh, $4 in my pocket and, and a million friends. So like his homemade glasses, Plenty's now looking back. He's just finished writing a book where he reminisces about that world record walk he'll always remember. Not to mention a few nights along the way, he'll never forget. This is John Prock reporting. Well, that's it for this time on the United Report. We invite you to watch a different edition of the United Report on your return flight. I'm Wes Sargentson. 
See you again soon on United Airlines, the official airline of the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles.